a pleasure to be here. Hey, thanks for the turnout. Really appreciate it. It's always good when it's free, right? And then a free meal after. So um, I've got kind of a US-centric talk. And some of that is because that's where the trouble is when it comes to public perceptions about climate change. So uh, forgive me if I'm sounding um, a little provincial, but uh, I think you'll understand when we get into it that this is where the problem lies. So, and I presume you know a little bit about the problems that we have with uh, communicating climate change as members of the media uh, and in the public policy realm in the United States. It's quite a problem still after all these years. Uh, let's talk about the present for just a moment. This just came out this past week, 411 parts per million and change. That's the average for the month of April for the wor uh, world. This is the, the famous Keeling curve data which is captured at Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. Uh, that is a, a number that uh, scientists would um, agree is a, a very dangerous number. The number we'd like to aim for is about 350 parts per million when it comes to carbon dioxide. That's news, that just happened. Uh, we also had a year with some devastating hurricanes, a series of them that hit the United States. We had extraordinary wildfires in California with some extraordinary conditions that combined to make that happen, drought and the combination of drought and some uh, interesting heavy rainfall uh, preceding it, which made for uh, incredible uh, creation of the fuel for these fires. Uh, you know, water distribution is obviously a huge deal when you start looking at what climate change will do to the planet. We also uh, lost a, a big hunk of the Larsen Sea ice shelf. Um, it's now the Larsen Sea iceberg. Um, David, you probably know exactly where it is right now. It's uh, somewhere out there. Hopefully the Titanic is nowhere near it, because that would be trouble, for sure. And uh, yeah, let's not forget what's going on with the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, it's part of a global reef die-off. Coral reefs everywhere are dying, and the, the Great Barrier Reef is heavily affected by this. These are significant events uh, we can no longer say this is one of these stories that is vague and distant and happening in the future and hard to find a picture for. Uh, and I'm going to get back to that point in a, in a little bit, but the constraints of what I do for a living as a television journalist are I need to shoot a picture of something. And up until very recently, really this year when you've, and you've got these events all conspiring together, it's been very difficult to give people real events to tell them it's happening. The concern, of course, is that hopefully we're not too late if this is the only opportunity to tell these stories in a way that engages them. This is um, uh, the University of Colorado spends a lot of time looking at coverage of climate change. And uh, it, what right here is current, that's April. We had a little uptick in April 2016. That was the conversation about <clears throat> Paris in the context of the election. Uh, this uh, right here, anybody want to guess what that one was? Climate Gate. Do you remember that one? That was the, the emails that were hacked out of the University of East Anglia, taken way out of context and used by opponents of climate change to suggest that scientists were being disingenuous. Uh, this uh, area right in here coincides with uh, Hurricane Katrina, followed by an inconvenient truth. And then uh, it kind of fell off when we got into the uh, 2008 recession. When people's uh, uh, pocketbooks are hurt, they're less interested, I guess, in, in uh, considering uh, climate change. Now, that's good. We, I mean, it's, we have a little uptick. You could say that's good. But there's quality and there's quantity, right? And let's uh, look at what the quantity, or quality, I should say, is. This is a, a little word chart of the most used words in the context of climate change right now, and like everything else in the United States right now, it all comes back to Trump. It's all about Trump, 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 Trump. Uh, if you've had the misfortune to watch CNN domestic lately, uh, what you are, will see, uh, you probably don't see it so much here, but basically it's eight people debating the latest tweet from Trump. And uh, so basically what we're, the, the kind of climate change content that we're getting right now is similar to the gist of this interview that uh, then candidate Trump had with then Fox anchor Bill O'Reilly. Back to work. Do you believe in global warming, climate change? Do you think the world's uh, going to change for the worse because it's getting warmer? 
I think that there'll be little change here. It'll go up. It'll get a little cooler. It'll get a little warmer like it always has for millions of years. It'll get cooler. It'll get warmer. It's called weather. I do believe in clean. And I've, I've received, a lot of people don't know this. I've received many environmental awards, many, many environmental awards for the work I do. So there you have it. That's a classic Trump answer, isn't it, right? A little bit warm, a little bit cold. We got the weather. It's a million years ago. Did I tell you about the awards I got? So when I say there's an uptick in climate change coverage, please do not applaud that just yet. Take a look at this. This is um, a survey that a group called Media Matters did uh, in the context of those uh, hurricanes I was telling you about. Uh, they looked at 1,500 stories about hurricanes by the major broadcast networks and PBS. God bless them for including us. Uh, they did 1,500 stories about the hurricanes. Trump was discussed in 907 of those, or um, about 60%. Business, climate change as it relates to business, 572 stories, 38%. And then climate change, in the context of hurricanes, was discussed 79 stories, or about 5%. You'll note, uh, ABC and uh, NBC didn't even bother to touch it. CBS did three, and uh, PBS did three. And here's my opportunity to do a little bit of self-promotion. Those three stories, they were mine. And the Associated Press now confirms that the death toll from Harvey has risen to 12. But even as we focus on Texas and Louisiana, nature is also taking a devastating toll elsewhere. Heavy monsoons are paralyzing Mumbai, India right now. More than 1,200 people have died so far. Connecting the dots between global warming and extreme weather is not a simple job for science. That's the topic of our Leading Edge segment this week. Scientists are loath to get ahead of their data, but what they see in Houston fits like a key piece in a giant complex puzzle. First, the disclaimers. Okay, so I do get credit for putting the disclaimers in, right? Most journalists wouldn't do that. Um, I, um, I am the um, hands down winner of the most handsome one-armed anchor in America, by the way. It, uh, it's a small category, but uh, hands up. I probably should stay away from the hand jokes. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about me uh, to give you full disclosure on who you're hearing all this science from. I don't know anything about science. I'm a history major at Georgetown. Uh, I um, avoided science like the plague. I stumbled into journalism somewhat sober. Uh, and I worked my way through the local news racket in a small TV station in St. Joseph, Missouri, Albany, New York, Tampa, Florida, and Boston, uh, at which time I heard that CNN was seeking a science correspondent. This is 1992. And I thought, well, um, I don't know much about science, but I do think CNN would be a good place to work. So I managed to talk my way into an interview. It turned out it was a two-day interview. The uh, CNN science editor at the time was a former molecular biologist. She actually knew quite a bit about science. And she gave me a uh, written and oral exam on science. And uh, in the course of this two-day ordeal, I, of course, flunked the test, because they asked me what climate change was. And I was looking at the thermostat on the wall, saying, well, you do, do you want it down a little bit? And uh, because I, I was busy chasing fires and bodies in local news. I wasn't paying any attention to this kind of thing. So I got to the end of this gauntlet of auditions, et cetera, and it sat in front of the president of CNN at the time, Bob Fernand, and he's kind of a Damon Runyon character, the big zoot suit going, and he, he's at his desk. He didn't even look up from his uh, paper, and he goes, well, obviously you don't know shit about science. <laughs> and, uh, and that was one of those moments in your life where you, you what do you do, right? You know? And I said, um, I went for the Hail Mary. I said, that's why you want to hire me. I said, you don't know science. Your audience doesn't know science. I don't either, but I'm not afraid of it. I'll, I'll give it a try, and I'll make sure I learn about it as I go. And so with that, I put the lab coat on, and off I went. And, um, and it was great. I had, I, my scientific education has been with Nobel laureates. I mean, you know, how lucky am I to have had this privileged experience of learning about the scientific endeavor, the process, the people, uh, the hunt for answers, uh, but from the best of the best. And you know, they, they actually take my phone calls. Uh, it's, science is such a, it, it's such a wonderful thing to cover as a journalist because when you think about what most journalists do, they dwell on problems. Science is about solutions. And it's, it's always nice to talk to people who are looking at problems, 
with solutions in mind. And so I consider it a great privilege to be a part of a very diminished cadre of science journalists uh, in uh, the United States, which we'll get into in a little bit. So I told you as a history major, let's do a little bit of history. In 1896, they discovered the greenhouse effect. Uh, Savante Arrhenius, you probably know all about him, Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, 1896, the famous paper which he published, said, you know, if you burn fossil fuels such as coal, adding carbon dioxide to the Earth's atmosphere, we would raise uh, the planet's uh, average temperature. Of course, it was just a theory at that time. Um, there was a lot of argument that it, that it was impossible for humans to, to do anything about this, that uh, we were way too puny to affect something as large as the climate, and that the balance of nature would, would take hold, and, and the emissions couldn't possibly change the climate. The media response to this was, uh, well, crickets. Um, this is April of 19, 1896. This is the only thing I saw. Hint to coal consumers. This is from Morgantown, North Carolina. So it's always about coal, isn't it? A Swedish professor has evolved a new theory of the extinction of the human race, which is interesting because Savante Arrhenius thought maybe climate change might be good. But anyway, he holds that uh, the combustion of coal by civilized man is gradually warming the atmosphere so that in the course of a few cycles of 10,000 years, the Earth will be baked in a temperature close to the boiling point. Um, so hint to coal consumers. Are they telling them to buy your coal early now? I don't know. But uh, you should know at that time in the world, uh, this, the, the journalism practice was not very professional uh, in the United States. The, the, the concept of mass media uh, had not arrived. Uh, professional journalists, certainly science journalists, that would come much later. So the idea that there would be um, reporters reading these papers and translating them into fodder for a mass audience uh, just hadn't happened yet. Uh, there's popular mechanics also did a little piece on this in 1911 based on all of this. And then I love this one from uh, the Boston uh, Globe in 1913 with uh, the Custom House there. And so it says, basically, picture the Atlantic rising and flooding Boston 100 feet of water with codfish swimming in and out of office windows, clams and oysters growing on roofs, <clears throat> and great tangles of seaweed flourishing in the public gardens. Of course, you'll see at the top there, they say it's going to take 500,000 years for this to happen. So I guess um, that would be low on your worry list for sure. Mass media started coming of age in the uh, 20s and 30s. And this was when <clears throat> uh, some significant science came into the mix. Uh, the scientist Guy Stewart Callender, who linked uh, CO2 emissions to uh, climate change, to global warming. Uh, he did that by compiling measurements of temperatures from the 19th century. And he correlated those with old measurements of atmospheric CO2 concentrations, put two and two together. And he figured that global uh, land temperatures had increased. And he proposed uh, that this increase could only be explained by the increase in carbon dioxide. He, too, thought it was going to be beneficial, that it would delay a return of those deadly glaciers. His work, pretty much unnoticed in 1938. Uh, Time magazine in 1939 did do a piece in their science section Science, warmer world, gaffers who claim that winters were harder when they were boys are quite right. Weathermen have no doubt that the world, at least for a time, is growing warmer. But no attempt to even talk about what the science had brought forth at this point. Let's fast forward now to the 50s. The 40s, everybody was focused on the war. There was not really any coverage whatsoever in the mass media on climate change. Uh, the uh, Saturday Evening Post. Now, this is getting into mainstream Americana, if you're in the Saturday Evening Post, complete with pictures. Uh, Life Magazine, Saturday Evening Post, before television, were uh, very important vehicles to, to get the, the public mind thinking about things like climate change. Uh, they did this piece in, uh, I believe it was 1953, and it went on and on about the weather, uh, saying that uh, this professor of the Swedish Geographical Institute had flatly declared that ordinary people are beginning to realize that something has happened weather-wise and is happening which is of great interest to themselves. If older people say they have lived through many more hard winters in their youth, they are stating a real fact. But this piece goes on and on, pictures and icebergs and all kinds of things. 
And the nut graph on what they think is happening says people are asking questions. Is the weather actually changing or are we just experiencing a few freak seasons? Has the Gulf Stream shifted? Is the sun throwing out more heat? Is the solar system in its 12 mile a second spiral through the Milky Way or Sol's home galaxy emerging from the last filmy fringes of a cloud of cosmic Dutch dust, which for centuries has prevented a small but critical portion of our luminaries radiation from reaching the Earth? That is a theory that the global warming deniers have got to try and emphasize today, huh? That's, I, that one went out of favor, but who knows? Maybe it is the Milky Way. Has atomic experimentation upset delicate thermal balances, perhaps by increasing molecular activity in the atmosphere? Is the warming up process worldwide or merely regional? Lots of good questions, but in this entire nine page spread with pictures, the, the word carbon is never mentioned. So missed the boat on that one. Great opportunity, but missed the boat. Uh, it's interesting that, uh, the Cold War and the funding of science as it relates to climate change uh, fed each other a little bit, or one fed the other. Uh, Gilbert Plass was a scientist at Johns Hopkins. He was assigned by the military to understand infrared radiation absorption. And this would be good for heat-seeking missiles. Uh, he uh, ended up uh, coming up with very influential discovery on exactly um, uh, some specificity about climate change, and that the CO2 in the atmosphere, in his view, would raise the Earth's average temperature 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit every 100 years. Uh, from 1956 onward, he published a series of stories, and he got some coverage. This is the Washington Post, the New York Times, um, Popular Mechanics. He predicted that a doubling of CO2 would warm the planet by 3.6 degrees Celsius, and that CO2 levels in 2000 would be 30% higher than in 1900, and that the planet would be one degree C warmer in 2000 than 1900. All pretty accurate numbers for a guy who was not using a computer. He was, uh, you know, that was a slide rule kind of calculation. So very, way ahead of his time, and a little bit now, here we are in the 50s, um, more professional journalists, science journalists are actually uh, existing now, and they're trying to tell this story to a mass audience and uh, let people know uh, what the scientists are saying. So what about television? 1958 is the first um, indication I have that it was discussed at all. And there used to be a show called the Bell Telephone Science Hour. And uh, we don't do shows like that anymore. But wait to see this. This is fascinating because it was produced by no less than Frank Capra. And it um, is amazingly prescient. Extremely dangerous questions, because with our present knowledge, we have no idea what would happen. Even now, man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. Due to our release through factories and automobiles every year of more than six billion tons of carbon dioxide, which helps air absorb heat from the sun, our atmosphere seems to be getting warmer. This is bad. Well, it's been calculated a few degrees rise in the Earth's temperature would melt the polar ice caps. And if this happens, an inland sea would fill a good portion of the Mississippi Valley. Tourists in glass-bottom boats would be viewing the drowned towers of Miami through 150 feet of tropical water. Foreign weather, we're not only dealing with forces of a far greater variety than even the atomic physicist encounters, but with life itself. So um, that was, uh, the professor, by the way, was Frank Be Baxter. He was an English literature professor at UCLA. And the straight man, for you movie buffs, was Richard Carlson. He was the leading man in Creature from the Black Lagoon. Little known IMDB fact there. So let's go to the 60s. The 60s, we discovered the environmental movement. The publication of Silent Spring in 1962 with Rachel Carson changed uh, a lot of things and brought forth the environmental movement. Much of the focus uh, in that decade, uh, in addition to the fact that we, the Vietnam War and race riots, et cetera, in the United States were going on, 
But much of the focus as it related to the environment was air and water pollution, uh, and the chemicals as, as a result of the pesticides. Meanwhile, uh, that's Charles David Keeling, the guy uh, with the graph at the beginning of this talk. He began his work uh, at initially Mauna Loa and the South Pole, uh, tracking CO2. Uh, it is um, very significant work. In 1960, there wasn't really paid attention to. Of course, he hadn't put together all that data just yet. He stopped uh, the, the South Pole work uh, along the way for lack of funding. But the Mauna Loa work is still funded by Scripps and is um, still important, as you saw um, earlier. It is still making news as it tracks kind of the definitive scorekeeper of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. At the end of the decade, the, uh, and there's the Keeling curve. At the end of the decade, uh, the environmental movement had taken great root and Earth Day had become, I think maybe this might have been the first, first Earth Day in 1970, in April of 1970. Take a look at this um, NBC Nightly News broadcast from that day. And uh, he, he begins in a more traditional way and I'll show you how he ends the broadcast. Earth Day demonstrations began in practically every city and town in the United States this morning, the first massive nationwide protest against the pollution of the environment. The outcry took innumerable forms. So he went on to go to various film pieces from all over the country, and then at the end of this broadcast had this little item to share this with This morning you. there was an awesome Earth Day warning from a government scientist in remarks prepared for the American Geophysical Union in Washington. Dr. J. Murray Mitchell said pollution and overpollution, unless checked, could so warm the Earth in 200 years as to create a greenhouse effect, melting the Arctic ice cap and flooding vast areas of the world. So best I could tell, that was April 1970. That's the first time a U.S. network newscast ever mentioned the concept of, of climate change and global warming. Uh, in 1972 on CBS, Walter Cronkite got into the climate mix, but this was a, kind of a wacky time in this decade. Listen to what, how he ended his broadcast uh, in September of 1972. British professor Hubert Lamb says that a new ice age is creeping over the northern hemisphere. Even then, it won't be as bad as the last ice age 60,000 years ago. Then New York, Cincinnati, St. Louis were under 5,000 feet of ice. Presumably, no traffic moved and school was let out for the day. And that's the way it is, Monday, <laughs> September 11th, 1972. Uh, Walter, what a jokester he is. Uh, so, yeah, kind of a flip thing, end of the broadcast. You'll notice the theme here, either it's very scant coverage uh, it's at the end of the show. It's buried in the newspaper. It doesn't really, um, there's a certain amount of a snicker factor to this story at this stage. It's distant. It's, it's not happening. Uh, yeah, Boston might be underwater in 500,000 years, so what? Uh, but then it got more confused. This cooling thing just wouldn't die. There were a number of papers in the 70s, a handful I would say, uh, that got into this idea that there actually might be a cooling period underway. Uh, there were two articles which are often cited to this day by climate change deniers and skeptics. Uh, the one on the left there is, uh, that's from Newsweek, and this one is from Time. They came out at pretty much the same time. Um, Peer-reviewed studies, yes, just a few of them that basically said that there was a cooling phase underway. What happened was, uh, it had much to do with our, our reduction in the use of aerosols, and it discounted the use of aerosols, and that was aerosols uh, are a cooling uh, forcing factor in climate change. You know, geoengineering, anybody? We, that's another talk. And, uh, and so ultimately, these stories didn't bear out, and the vast majority of scientists uh, did not agree with these conclusions. The, the, the huge, overwhelming science was... Uh, indicating otherwise. And yet, to this day, in the 2016 election, Ted Cruz, running for president, brought this shop-worn thing up in a Let's say debate. that it's not. It, it, Let's but, say but, it's but, not but, clear. But, but, Why not do everything we can to reduce our carbon footprint? Wouldn't that be good to, and to be... To have some humility about it and maybe think. Okay, let's, let, let's talk about, about having humility. I read this morning a Newsweek article from the 1970s talking about global cooling. And it said the science is clear. It is overwhelming. We are in a major cooling period, and it's going to cause enormous problems worldwide. And the solution for all the advocates in the 70s of global cool cooling 
was massive government control of the energy sector, of our economy, and, and, and aspects of our lives. Now, the data proved to be not backing up that theory. So then all the advocates of global cooling suddenly shifted to global warming. And they advocated it's warming. And the solution, interestingly enough, was the exact same solution, government control of the energy sector and every aspect of our lives. So you get the idea here. So careful what you write, right? Um, and the, the writer of that Newsweek article has long since sort of explained, recanted, apologized for what he did because he's given them a red herring which uh, survives to this day. We get to the 1980s and all of a sudden climate change, uh, the story took on new dimension. First of all, it was the heyday of science reporting in the mass media. New York Times, the uh, CNN science unit at the time, we had eight people in our unit. Uh, newspapers all over the country typically had uh, reporters who specialized in science coverage. And meanwhile, the science was coalescing and um, led by some government scientists, Jim Hansen, funded by NASA. Uh, there was uh, a lot of data that was coming in. Uh, this story is from 1981. It's the first time uh, that it got front page treatment on the New York Times, climate change that is. This is below the fold, but we'll take the front page. And uh, basically, it's, it's the lead lines were this. A team of federal scientists says it has detected an overall warming trend in the Earth's atmosphere extending back to the year 1880. They regard this as evidence of the validity of the greenhouse effect in which increasing amounts of carbon dioxide cause steady temperature increases. The seven atmospheric scientists predicted a global warming of almost unprecedented magnitude in the next century. It might even be sufficient to melt and dislodge the ice cover of West Antarctica, they say, eventually leading to a worldwide rise of 15 to 20 feet in sea level. Again, a very prescient couple of paragraphs there. That's fairly accurate science reporting. Later that decade, Jim Hansen, seen there, would uh, testify uh, before Congress. And when asked, said he was 99% certain that the warming that they have tracked at, to that date was caused by a buildup of carbon dioxide and other artificial gases in the atmosphere. So at this point, the media has awakened. And that, by the way, that la the, the story that uh, I just told you about, that was um, an above the fold front page story. Uh, the media had gotten it. Uh, Well-trained professional science journalists were telling the story. And what was really interesting about this time is um, the, uh, the forces that try to muddy the waters were still not in the game. And so what you saw is a, a, quite a bit of bipartisanship on this subject. One of the leaders in the Senate on, on this whole issue, John McCain. And uh, you may recall that the, the first George Bush president uh, actually addressed the IPCC, recognized the problem, and, and talked about using good science, which today seems like almost crazy talk for a president. Let's listen to what he had to say. We all know that human activities are changing the atmosphere in unexpected and in unprecedented ways. Much remains to be done. Many questions remain to be answered. And together, we have a responsibility to ourselves and the generations to come to fulfill our stewardship obligations. But that responsibility demands that we do it right. We acknowledge a broad spectrum of views on these issues, but our respect for a diversity of perspective does not diminish our recognition of our obligation or soften our will to produce policies that work. Some may be tempted to exploit legitimate concerns for political positioning. Our responsibility is to main the quality, maintain the quality of our approach, our commitment to sound science, and an open mind to policy options. Now that's a, that's a Republican that doesn't exist anymore. You know, that, that idea that a Republican could stand up and recognize climate change and embrace sound science, that, that is a quaint notion, sadly. And um, it'd be nice to see if we could get back to that place, sort of the, it's almost like the Nixon to China thing. If you could find a Republican that could stand up and admit uh, what we all know to be true scientifically and address and get beyond this silly debate that whether it's happening or not, 
and start looking at ways that we can mitigate, which is where we should have our debate right now. So how did it happen? Well, it, yeah, they probably um, uh, were really nervous about their, their finances, and I'm talking about the fossil fuel industry. So right around this time, they um, hired a bunch of people who were very successful with tobacco in stalling efforts to uh, have the Surgeon General's report come out to indicate to the American people that uh, cigarettes cause cancer, to stand in the way of uh, regulations for secondhand smoke. And the theory of the tobacco play playbook is just delay. Muddy the waters, introduce just a little bit of doubt, and the uh, debate will go off the rails. Journalists will take the bait, and uh, the real science will get drowned out by a few outlier points, a little bit of uncertainty, which, as we all know, science is filled with. Uh, there's always uncertainty. There's always outliers. There's always cherries to be picked. And so that's what happened. Uh, the same crew, the same PR teams, the same hacks went out. And uh, the American Petroleum Institute was very open about it. They spent uh, millions of dollars to hire scientists to toe the line and uh, share the, their insights of what climate change might mean from their perspective. Uh, they recruited this cadre of, of scientists who are still in play, still receiving money from the fossil fuel interests uh, to say these things. Uh, the, right around the same time, uh, Frank Luntz, who is a uh, legendary, some would say infamous, Republican pollster and uh, advisor to Republican candidates, uh, wrote up a memo uh, for Republicans in general and his candidates specifically, which says this, the scientific debate is closing against us, but not yet closed. There's still a window of opportunity to challenge the science. Voters believe that there is no consensus about global warming within the scientific community. Should the public come to believe that the scientific issues are settled, their views about global warming will change accordingly. Therefore, you need to continue to make the lack of scientific certainty a primary issue in the debate and defer to scientists and other experts in the field. That is the playbook which is still in play. And it brings us scientists. There's a whole, you've seen them all. You've heard from them all. Folks, Pat Michaels, Cato Institute. Uh, one of the more famous ones is uh, Willie Soon, who is um, with the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. He's an astrophysicist. He believes it all has to do with sun cycles, and he denies that carbon dioxide has anything to do uh, with climate change at all, which is a pretty ex extreme position to take these days when you think about the science that is there. Uh, a couple years ago, he was at a talk, and it was, uh, I think, a student reporter uh, went after him a little bit. Listen to her. She did a good job. Uh, you have received over a million dollars in funds oh, from okay. coal and oil interests. The oh. last grant you received from a funder with no ties to the energy industry was in 2002. That's over a decade ago. Okay. So, Dr. Soon, why should we trust someone without credentials in climate science whose work is only funded by coal and oil. Without credential? Who is that to judge? In, in climate without, science. I understand you're an astrophysicist. Just a minute. Without credential in climate science, so what is climate science? Do you know anything about climate science? The question I'm asking you... No, no, no. I'm asking you to answer that question first. First of all, do you know that that approach is called ad hominem? So uh, we should give her a contract, huh? That was, she, she, it kept going. You look it up on the web. It's well worth watching the whole thing. It devolves. He finally just quits and walks out. That was the end of that. Uh, the, the, the skeptics and deniers, the fossil fuel interests, there's, there's no greater political leader of that group than Senator Jim Inhofe, uh, Republican of uh, natural gas, I mean Oklahoma. And he, um, you know, he happens to be the chairman of the Environment and Public Works Committee in the Senate and is one of the most, uh, he's the one who says it's the biggest hoax ever perpetuated on the American public. And back in February of 2014, thought he was so clever because they were talking about um, some climate uh, uh, legislation that was working its way through. I believe this was cap and trade that they were discussing. And he decided to be clever, 
to bring a little prop in to the Senate floor. In case we have forgotten, because we keep hearing that 2014 has been the warmest year on record, I asked the chair, you know what this is? It's a snowball, and that's just from outside here. So it's very, very cold out, very unseasonal. So here, Mr. President, catch this. Mm -hmm. That closes the case for me, right? No climate change. He had, if he found a snowball in Washington on February of 2014, therefore, no climate change. Uh, and that's pretty much how the argument goes on that side. Another category of very effective um, deniers and skeptics are the weather guys and women. Uh, weather casters in the United States are really pretty much the only quote unquote science that anybody sees on television from anybody, scientist, whatever, technical person. And um, historically, there have been a ton of deniers and skeptics in this group. And uh, this, this gentleman, uh, the godfather, the, the granddaddy of all weather casters, is a big part of the reason. His name is John Coleman. Hello, I'm John Coleman, and the name of this presentation is There Is No Significant Global Warming. And I'm the guy that is just doggone sure of that. Now, you may think that I'm just a paid-off shill, big oil, or something of that sort. No, 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 no. They've never given me a nickel. I'm a television weathercaster with 60 years experience, a meteorologist. Uh, I was the first weatherman on Good Morning America. I'm the man who founded the Weather Channel. And this is my accomplishment. Broadcast Meteorologist of the Year from the American Meteorological Society, of which I was a professional member for many years. I finally quit the AMS when it became very clear to me that the politics had gotten in the way of the science. So he goes on, that's quite a lengthy uh, takedown of climate change science in his view, but you know, it reminds me, it's sort of the, I'm not a scientist, but I play one on TV thing. And he has that uh, hint of credibility, and it turns out that an awful lot of uh, weathercasters followed suit. In 2010, researchers at George Mason and University of Texas uh, surveyed 571 television weathercasters. And uh, they determined that about only, only about half of them believed global warming was occurring at all. Fewer than a third believed that climate change was caused mostly by human activities. And this is, this is a, a tremendous uh, wasted opportunity because 56% of Americans at that time trusted weathercasters to tell them about global warming more than they trusted other members of the news media or Vice President Gore or any, pick your person. And that's me with the weathercaster who uh, I knew very well at CNN, Chad Myers. He was a dyed-in-the-wool climate change denier. He, he believed that the reason that, that climate change had become, the data had come in, is that the thermometers were placed in cities where there was too much concrete. And this is a weather guy on CNN. I should tell you that just Two years ago, he recanted all that. He finally saw the wisdom or the lack of wisdom of his previous thinking. But that kind of um, opportunity missed, you know, for, uh, taking, taking you back to that first story. Here's a hurricane. Let's try to connect the dots to the bigger picture. There's an opportunity every night for a weathercaster in America to do the same kind of thing and say, you know, this, this drought we're in, let me remind you about the big picture here. I'm told that at Pennsylvania State University, which is the largest meteorological school in the United States, they're changing their curriculum now to include much more on climate. Because the truth is, these guys never learned climate historically. They thought that because they could do the, you know, the three-day forecast that they knew about climate. But they know about weather. And of course, those are two uh, entirely different things. Um, there's also been yeah, there's a journalistic convention, a few journalistic conventions worth talking about here. Uh, one is uh, we, we uh, typically journalists are looking for friction. We're looking for debate. We're, we're looking for he said, she said, point, counterpoint. Uh, there was a huge uptick in coverage right around the, the aforementioned uh, release of those emails, the so-called climate gate, with all kinds of reminders that there may not be truth to the whole climate change story, that scientists have been lying. Uh, the whiff of conspiracy is just red meat for most people in television. 
The other thing that's you know red meat when you look at cable in particular is this idea of debate. It's always got to be, you know, for historically at CNN and, and particularly in the '90s, I'd say I want to do a climate change story, and they'd say, "Well, what about the other side?" And I would say to them, "What about the other side?" There, you know, 97 percent of the world's scientists say one thing, and then there's you know these couple of cranks over here that say the opposite, does that mean I have to put that person on to quote unquote balance the story? And they would say yes. Now this is, this is a journalistic conceit which comes out of really covering politics more than anything. You know, you get the Democrats, so you gotta get the Republican and vice versa. And, and by doing that, by putting, giving them equal time, you've somehow gotten to some degree of truth. It's actually also very lazy if you think about it because what, what it means is the reporter uh, is reduced to a stenographer, uh, taking down notes from both sides, trying to get the, the key points across in the two minute or three minute story they have and doing it in an even handed way. But does that really get us anywhere close to the truth? And during the 90s, there were a series of these really stupid idea debates and a lot of sm otherwise smart people who care about climate change and are worried about it would take the bait, putting real scientists, and while, what I'm about to show you is kind of an asterisk beside that, it's Bill Nye the science guy, but nonetheless, up against uh, hardcore climate deniers who have no scientific uh, pedigree whatsoever. So take a look, this is on the Piers Morgan show. I think this was uh, in the early 2000s. Joining me now are Bill Nye, the science guy, and Mark Morano, he's the publisher of climatedepot.com. Welcome to you both. Let me start with you, Thank you. and Mark Morano. If sure. I may, uh, you are implacably opposed to the concept of man-made climate change. Why? We followed the evidence. Uh, there are quite literally hundreds of factors that influence global temperature. Everything from tilt to the Earth's axis to ocean cycles to water vapor, methane, solar system, the sun, cloud feedback, volcanic dust. The idea that CO2 is the tail that wags the dogs is not supportable. And if you go down and look at the scientific literature, we're finding reams of, do of data and new peer-reviewed studies showing the medieval and Roman warming periods as warm or warmer than today without our CO2 emissions. So what's happened here is the whole movement, because now we've gone 16 years without global warming, according to the UN data, and they've now morphed into extreme weather. And we have the absurd spectacle of people claiming that acts of Congress and the United Nations can control the weather and make hurricanes less nasty and make torne tornadoes less frequent, which, by the way, none of them are showing any trends at all that are unusual. Okay, Bill Nye. Your response? Well, we start talking about the facts. The, those uh, medieval those the warming facts. period and the Roman, you know, Roman warming period, well, those I, are just... I, I, I'm running a little short on time, but I will tell you this. Uh, to the casual viewer, Mark Morano owned Bill Nye, and everything, absolutely every word out of his mouth was a complete lie. Uh, Mark Morano, just so you know, I mean, it was hard to, it's hard to stack up the lies in that one little soundbite. There are so many of them. Mark Morano uh, cut his teeth as a researcher for Rush Limbaugh, went on to become a staffer for Jim Inhofe, Snowball Man, and now runs an outfit called Climate Depot and is writing books about uh, his climate denial. No scientific credibility whatsoever, but the man can talk and he can spit out those um, w talking points, whatever you want to call them, uh, very effectively. And if you don't pay enough attention, uh, you could say he had the better of Bill Nye. You really have to do your homework. And that is a huge disservice to the general public, in my view. Shame on CNN for allowing that to happen. Uh, I think less of it happens now, but that is, uh, a, that is a, a huge problem. To sort of highlight the problem, John Oliver, who's now one of my favorite journalists with Last Week Tonight, did an entire show on climate change, and he ended it with, a climate change debate. I, I don't know if you've seen this, but it's worth watching. Last Week Tonight presents a statistically representative climate change debate. Good evening. Joining me tonight, a climate change denier and naturally Bill Nye science guy. <laughs> Humans are causing climate change, no wait, question. Wait, 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 wait. Before we begin, on, in the interest of mathematical balance, I'm going to bring out two people who agree with you, climate skeptic, and Bill Nye, I'm also going to bring out 96 other scientists. <laughs> uh, it's a little unwieldy, but this is the only way you can actually have a representative discussion. Uh, so, yeah, please, 
please file in. Again, again, this is, this is going to make the debate difficult. We shouldn't really be having it in the first place. But, uh, so, representationally, climate sceptic, please make a case against climate change. Well, I just don't think all the science is in yet. It's settled. OK, and what is the overwhelming view of the entire scientific community? Well... <laughs> OK, OK. So you get on top of that, climate change is a story that is hard to sell uh, editors. This is the president of CNN uh, in 2014. Climate change is one of those stories that deserves more attention that we all talk about, but we haven't figured out how to engage the audience in that story in a meaningful way. When we do these stories, there does tend to be a tremendous amount of a lack of interest on the audience's part. You know, CNN used to be all about science. I was in the science and technology unit, sponsored by AT&T. We did three pieces a week plus a weekly show. And at the time, it was absolutely mandated that those science pieces run because this, this was early days of CNN when they were a little worried about meeting the payroll. And if the uh, AT&T spot did not air subsequently to the uh, science piece, there was a loss of revenue. So producers damn well ran the science pieces. Over time, however, CNN got more uh, successful and there was no longer these linkages between uh, revenue and science, and science disappeared because producers didn't have to run it. And by 2008, I thought I was flying high as the science correspondent there, but myself and six producers, it does take a village to prop me up. Uh, we all got dumped on one day because, hey, what do we know about the Kardashians anyway? Uh, so I, I went home, grew a beard, of course, because what do you do when you get fired? And I started watching a lot of CNN, and, and um, what I saw was kind of frightening because without people who understand science, who cover it specifically, this is what you get. Take a look at these pictures that we're going to be sharing with you. I was just asking Chad, <laughs> how can you get a volcano in Iceland? Isn't it too... too when, you think of, when you think of a volcano, you think of like Hawaii and long words like that. You don't think of Iceland. You All think right. it's too cold to have a volcano there. But no... There it is. Look at that. What, do you, what is this? That is Go a, that take is, us through these pictures. That, that is a plume of ash coming out of the top of a volcano, going straight up. Well, what's tens, the white stuff, though? Tens that of thousands. Like That's just a cloud. Oh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm just going to close it with that, because it's hard to top that. But I will say this. Uh, science journalism, journalism in general, has gone through a battering in the past 10 years. Uh, I think the number of reporters in mainstream newspapers in the United States has dropped by about 40%. Uh, the number of science units went from uh, 150 or so to like five. Uh, so the, the, the people who actually dedicate their careers to trying to understand this and translate it and share it with a mass audience who get paid enough to cover the mortgage to do that, there are few and far of us. I, I'm kind of the last man standing. And so in this world of social media, I just want to make uh, a pitch to you all to remember the value of good journalism. Uh, it's become a commodity. We don't want to pay for it. We're on the internet. We're always trying to find a free version of what it is. But you know what? To do what I do costs a lot of, bit of, a lot of money. And so I invite you to think about that as you make the decision of whether to hop across the paywall and subscribe to a, a publication or support ProPublica, an excellent nonprofit that does investigative journalism. You pick the journalism you like, but it, it's not, it shouldn't be free. And uh, we've set up this mindset that we want it for free, but uh, what we get is uh, what we pay for. Thank you for your attention. Okay. <clears throat> You're welcome. Questions. Uh, our next guest uh, is um, Mr. Al Hamadi. Please come up. Uh, from the Ministry of Climate Change and the Environment and the UAE Lead Negotiator on Climate Change. Prior to joining the ministry, uh, Mr. Al Hamadi worked in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation as the Section Head of Climate Change and Sustainability. Uh, he started his career in the field of petrochemicals in Abu Dhabi uh, with the Polymer Company uh, for 10 years and holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Tulsa University, USA. Please, Mr. Al Hamadi.
Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks, Miles, for the great presentations. And I won't be able to share these old captures of videos and magazines as yours, because I remember the first time we introduced TV in our home, maybe early 80s, not that far as 50s. And what I remember from that time, I was keep rotating the receiver in order to get the signals. <laughs> So thanks again for your uh, presentation and good evening, everyone. I'm very pleased here to be with you this evening as a climate change is no doubt one of the most pressing global issues we face today as clearly indicated in the presentation from Miles. And uh, speaking about climate change, uh, maybe the most common discussions we hear, we read in the newspaper, uh, mainly generally uh, nowadays, done in terms of a global climate change. But we shall also not forget, we don't live in a global scale. We live more into UAE level or in New York. So we want to understand how the climate change impacted us to that level. Because you cannot take the scenario from the global level and apply it into your region or your countries. Because sometimes it could be double than it's the global, when it's come to the region out of your location, or it could be less. So it's very important for UAE, when it comes to the climate change, we want to understand where is the impact is going to happen in UAE. We don't have overflooding, we don't have hurricanes as what the small islands or the USA has experienced, especially in Florida. So we have different environments. Sometimes when you put these scenarios into the public, it will be very difficult to believe it at the beginning, unless they witness it different than other countries or other regions. So speaking about UAE, in, in my talk, I would like to share with you how UAE is approaching climate change and what kind of action we are taking. Like other countries in the region, the UAE is well aware of the potential challenges. And that is why we are firmly committed in meeting the global target of, to the limit warming, limit warming under the Paris Agreement to climate change and the UN Sustainable Development Goal, specifically on the goal 13, which is related to the climate change. So here in UAE, we are fostering our climate action through clear policies and partnership with the belief that while challenging climate change bring opportunities on multiple levels, including economic opportunities. This is something we always, I take it in my life, when every problem, there is a solutions, but I am not only focusing on the solutions. I have to see what are the opportunities that I can get from the problem. This is what we are looking at it from UA perspective. It is an issue, it's a global threat, but we see there is a lot of opportunities coming with it. So we need to see what are the opportunities that we can speak publicly and take the advantage of passing this to everyone. So last year we have launched our national climate change plan 2050 which is the start after the restructuring which took place in two years ago where we, we formed the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment. So the climate plan is a comprehensive framework to transition into climate resilient green economy while managing greenhouse gases emissions and minimizing the climate risk and increase the climate adaptation capabilities. Today's discussion, when we attend all these international platforms, we talk about energies, mitigation, mitigation, and there's less talk happening on the other side of adaptation. We want to create fair balance between the two issues, the adaptation and mitigation. This is something that really, it is one of our priorities, what we are doing today within the ministry. So the plan also put a strong emphasis on engaging the private sectors and other stakeholding, uh, stakeholders, including the academia and uh, youth in developing innovative solutions because government alone cannot address the challenges associated with climate change. So at the core of our climate plan are the national clean energy target of achieving 27% by 2021 and 50% by 2050. So we are working toward meeting these ambition targets through introduction of a peaceful uh, nuclear energy and renewable energy uh, at scale. So furthermore, we are also working toward meeting our national target to improve the energy efficiencies by 40% by 2050 through various means, including the introduction of building code, district coolings, uh, appliance efficiency standard, and mass public uh, transport uh, system. So in a climate adaptation, which is my, my favorite topic, 
We have launched the National Climate Change Adaptation Program in September last year at the annual meeting of the governments. We have identified four key sectors that we would like to start with, the health sector, energy, infrastructure, and environment as the first set priority sectors that we will really would like to work with them and set their priorities when it comes to the uh, adaptations, uh, adaptations. We have completed the health sectors. We came with a very good finding, which is aligned with the World Health Organizations. Today, we have started the risk assessment, the validation workshop for the energy sectors. It will continue till the end of the week with the uh, infrastructure. And inshallah, after Ramadan, we will do with the health sector. And we do have, uh, I'm sure, some representative from New York University attending the sessions today at the ministry. So we are working uh, to identify projected changes in a climate trend uh, and assess how these changes affect each sectors in economic, social, and environmental dimension using a comprehensive risk assessment framework, which we have designed that might applicable for this uh, region or this country. Once the identifier risks are prioritized, then measures to mitigate the risk will be developed and implemented in coordination with this uh, sector. Another area of concern for us is, is the impact of climate change on biodiversity, which is, uh, an expected, is expected to result in overall biodiversity losses in both marine and terrestrial environment. So studies have been conducted in UAE to better understand the value of our ecosystem and their vulnerability to climate change to come up with appropriate policy uh, measures. This includes the uh, assessment of the blue carbon ecosystem, such as the mangrove and seagrasses, which not only provide breeding grounds for marine species, but also sequesters and store carbon. So that conservation measures could be enhanced in, in, in the country. So, uh, but addressing climate change is not an easy and it must be collective effort by everyone at the stake. So this is where a partnership and awareness raising come into play. The UAE is a prime convener and facilitator for climate action at the global level by offering platform to bring together stakeholders uh, from different regions and sector for solution-oriented discussions and fostering practical action. Let me give you some example that has been delivered or achieved uh, recently with this event that has been organized recently within UAE. In order to raise, bring climate change at the highest level, the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment has been organizing a dedicated session on climate change during the World Government Summit during the Q quarter one of this year. At this year's summit, we have launched the Climate Project, an initiative in a partnership with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperations, together with the International Renewable Energy IRENA and the International Federation Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, Antigua Barbuda and Robert De Niro, to create a climate initiative that will impact uh, 10 million people by uh, 2020. Also, at the World Government, we have launched the SDG 13 Global Council, chaired by our Minister, His Excellency Dr. Thani al Ziyudi, which is a two year initiative to promote innovative and practical solutions to address complex uh, climate changes, challenges, with the support of a dozen of leaders and thinkers on climate change. And during Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week, if, if, if you guys passed uh, by during uh, January this year, we have launched the Climate Innovation Exchange Forum, CLIX, which connects entrepreneurs and uh, innovators with investors to help drive sustainable climate change solutions. Over 360 submissions were received from 65 countries covering uh, for three themes, climate, uh, three themes, air quality, transport, and uh, agriculture field. We decided to stop in one month because we found that we will be running out of time. Then we need to do the judgment in order to, to select uh, people to be present their idea at the, uh, at the session. So from the 65 countries covering these four themes, and while Eclix initially sought to secure fund value for 2.2 million US dollar investor at the end expressed their intent to invest 45.5 million over three years period, which is something beyond our expectations during that week uh, sessions uh, of ADSW. The UAE has also supporting other developing countries with renewable energy deployment, which play a key role 
and not only in a climate mitigation, but also bring considerable socioeconomic benefit. Close to one billion US dollar have been deployed to date, benefiting over 30 countries around the world. Last but not least, in October this year, UAE will be hosting the 13th meeting of the Ramsar Convention on Wetland, which aim to facilitate discussions <coughs> on the impact of a climate change on wetlands among members which is an important ecosystem in sustaining our environment. But all these efforts will be in vain and of our future generation are not aware or equipped to address climate change. That is why we are working with the Minister uh, of State for Youth Affairs, Her Excellency Shamma al mazrui and others to help put climate change in the forefront of youth engagement to foster the next generations of climate and sustainability-minded leaders. We have included 60 students in the UAE delegation to the last two UN annual climate change conferences, COP23 in Marrakesh and COP24 in Bonn from New York University, Masdar Institute, Khalifa University, and Emirates Diplomatic Academy and the Emirates Youth Council as part of our commitment to build capacity. And at COP24, we have launched the Youth Climate Mentorship Program, which aims to increase youth capacity in UN climate negotiation and national climate change related policy development processes. But we have also need to start a young age. This is why the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment is jointly working with the Ministry of Education to initiate our generations to develop school curriculum that focuses on climate change amongst other environmental priorities. Our ministry also has conducted education and public awareness campaign at the national level through organizing workshops for the implementation of sustainable school initiative as well holding an annual exhibition such as My Environment, My National Responsibility and the National Environment Day exhibitions which tackle different environmental issues in fun and innovative uh, ways. It is our hope that through this capacity building effort, our youth will be interested in pursuing their career in relevant fields, uh, be it to work with us at the ministry to develop policies to support climate actions or become part of our international negotiation team, conduct a uh, negotiation team, conduct research at universities on climate modeling or become other teachers to collective interest and foster innovative thinking uh, in young students. New York University Abu Dhabi students have been active in engaging in these efforts and I look forward to your continued participation in various activities with the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment and beyond. And I really uh, thank you for giving me that slot to join you this session and we look forward to but join you in a future uh, session. And uh, I have also to apologize at the end where I will not be able to stay for the sessions as I have to catch up for my uh, second meeting uh, with the EAD. And uh, I thank you again for the sessions. Thank you. Thank you. I have brought uh, a number of copies, five copies, but I don't think it's going to be enough for this number. But I would really encourage and advise you to visit the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment website, where you will be having uh, direct access to our electronic copy of the National Climate Change Plan, which draw the map from now till 2050, which is the first of its kind in, in, in this region, especially in the Middle East. And I will look forward to work with you in the future. Thank you.